So we're back with Jez Littlewood of the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs, Kurt Jensen from Political Science, and Jeff Sallett from the School of Journalism. And we've now got some opportunity for some questions, and we, I'd ask each of our questioners to uh, identify yourself first and direct your question to a single person, and then we'll get other members of the panel who may want to respond as well. Yes, please, just direct it to one person first, and then, and then uh, other members of the panel can respond and can answer as well. So. Okay, and my name is Barry Wright. My name is Barry Wright, and uh, I have a question for Jess. Um, I'm wondering what sort of obstacles are related to the, to the discussion of, uh, of accountability and legislative oversight. I'm wondering what obstacles there are to expanding the Security Intelligence Review Committee, which of course is very, very carefully crafted, coming out of the McDonald Commission and the creation of CSIS. And, and, uh, and we know with the Anti-Terrorism Act uh, 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 amendments that came in 2001 that uh, at least uh, CSEC was recognized and acknowledged that it didn't really have a legislative mandate. We know the Official Secrets Act was amended. That, of course, was long overdue. It was very charter unfriendly. Uh, it, the amendments to the New Security of Information Act really don't address the sorts of issues that we're talking about. I'm wondering, what, what obstacle is there to creating, broadening the mandate of the Security Intelligence Review Committee? They're, they're a purpose-built committee. They, it could be expanded. It's a, it's a way of, of uh, enhancing accountability. It would allow for greater coordination between what CSIS, the RCMP, and CSEC are up to, uh, make things more transparent. I understand in the UK that uh, I may be wrong, but there is an umbrella for MI5, MI6, and GCHQ. So what's preventing that uh, from being followed through on here in Canada? I think it's, it's probably a, a mindset approach to this issue. Um, it's, it's, an, it's a mindset approach to this issue in the sense that the Security Intelligence Review Committee, CERC, was established to cover, to cover CSIS. Now, certainly in the wake of the uh, O'Connor inquiry, which dealt with Mahar, the incident involving <coughs> Mahar Ra, there was some notion of updating the accountability structure, which included what, we, what essentially became known as the super CERC, where CERC would start taking some responsibilities or have responsibilities for the intelligence community writ large. And this would include the RCMP's uh, National Security Criminal Investigations branch. There's still a logic to that which might be worth exploring, but in the, the danger is that we start thinking about CERC and we start to forget that in actual fact for the accountability agency or structure to work, it needs expertise within it that deals very much with a, a single a portion of the pie. So we need experts who deal with CSIS and we need experts who deal with CSEC and we need experts who might, for example, know national security criminal investigations <coughs> for the RCMP. Each of those has a different mandate, each of them has different responsibilities. So bringing all that together in a single structure risks creating uh, an organization which is unwieldy, which I won't say be will become overly bureaucratic, but will have problems, at least in legislation, where how do they share information? Uh, how do they do their discrete task at one point in time, yet have the ability to share information when they have to follow an investigation or an intelligence uh, issue across numerous organizations? So I, I think if you go down the route of a, a super CERC, some very careful legal and organizational thinking needs to occur. It sounds attractive. My fear would be it would be very complex. The, the counter to this has been the notion of what we call statutory gateways, or the ability for the different discrete agencies to cooperate and work with each other when it is required. Uh, and I don't think any system is going to be perfect, uh, but we'll, you know, some more detailed thought has to be given to what the roles will be. Kurt or Jeff, any thoughts? Um, I think Jess is absolutely correct. There are, it's not impossible, but there are uh, substantial difficulties that really boil down to the mandates and the um, rules of operations of each of the organizations. Like something like uh, CSIS is subject to, or should be subject to, much more stringent control uh, and oversight simply because it is dealing with Canadian nationals. Uh, military intelligence uh, and uh, uh, foreign intelligence, which operates largely outside Canadian borders, do not uh, impact directly on Canadian citizens. 
Uh, CBSA does and has a substantial intelligence organization. Transport Canada has a very large uh, intelligence organization and also has an impact on Canada. But each of them have different operational mandates and they have different trade craft. And it's the trade craft that must be reviewed and studied to make sure that you're working, playing within the rules, if you will. And I, I, I simply don't believe that an, a single organization could do it. One of the discussions that have taken place is that you have a, a certain type entity that is responsible for all the administrative uh, st stuff that is associated with this, but then you have um, um, units within that that is focused on each of the different streams of intelligence collection. That could work. So if I, I might just jump in directly in response to that. Sure. I'm not entirely confident that signals intelligence doesn't have an impact on Canadian citizens. Well, you I, have I, five I eyes and you have intelligence sharing and you have, for instance, the events, uh, revelations around what happened in Toronto. You, there is there is a, a concern about well, most of the stuff that these was operations having a spillover effect on Canadian citizens. Most of the stuff that uh, happened in Toronto with the G20 is what I assume you talked about. Uh, well, frankly, the media got it wrong. If you read the, the um, memo, it basically reads like hundreds of others, both Canadian, Australian, American, whatever, that basically set out what is going to happen in Toronto in terms of the, um, keeping the president, in this case, informed. Um, whenever the president travels, he travels with a unit from um, NSA that basically has the portable SIG uh, equipment that can communicate back and forth to headquarters so that the president can be updated on events. A lot of the memo was tied to what threat and what he would encounter once he arrived in Canada. Nothing was talking about what NSA would be doing in Canada. This is all something that was created by the media because it's a good story. Whether or not it's true is a different matter. Jeff, any thoughts? Yeah. And then we'll uh, go on to our next question. The, I, um, I don't know the particulars of the G20 uh, and the document. It, uh, you know, I don't write those stories anymore. But I'll tell you, I, we would be very naive to think that the Americans have not uh, spied on uh, our government. Uh, I know. For example, uh, during the free trade negotiations, uh, uh, Canadian officials would uh, uh, come down from Ottawa to uh, Washington and uh, elaborate uh, steps were, were taken to make sure that uh, uh, computers were uh, secure, that uh, rooms were not, uh, hotel rooms were not bugged and so on. Uh, and uh, is that because of a lack of trust in our partners or uh, is it perhaps a little bit of larceny in our own soul that we would do it ourselves if we could get away with it? Uh, the, the rule, uh, I think the, oh, the only fundamental rule about spying is don't get caught. Uh, we're seeing now uh, that uh, the leveling effect of, uh, of leaks coming from people with access to uh, uh, data uh, bases uh, is uh, making that much more difficult for the spies. Can I, can yeah, I add sure. one? Sure quick note on that. It is quite true that the Americans had information about Canadian uh, negotiation strategies, but they were often, or almost certainly, based on what other nations that were be being collected against, what they were interpreting the Canadian positions to be. Th this is quite common that you will target everyone who's not a member of the Five Eyes community, and some of them have very exceptionally bright uh, diplomats that more or less get it right most of the time. And there's enough public information that becomes available in these negotiations that someone who actually has a good insight can probably draw the right conclusions. That kind of material, I'm sure that the Americans had, just as I'm fairly sure that the Canadians had. Let's go to our next question. Uh, I'll direct this question at Jess. And your name is? Alex. Okay. <laughs> uh, from the Department of Sociology. So uh, in recent years, we've seen CSIS uh, taking an interest, greater interest in these generally nonviolent social movements uh, like animal rights protests, environmentalist protests, uh, and even the Occupy movement. Uh, basically, they're generating intelligence on them, sharing it with the RCMP, other agencies, uh, and at times classing them, classifying them uh, through this notion of multi-issue extremism, uh, which basically groups them together with uh, terrorism. So my question is, uh, 
should CSIS be taking an interest in these groups, uh, or should it not? <laughs> Good <laughs> luck. A, it's a great question in terms of the, the multi-issue extremists. Um, one of the challenges faced by the CSIS and those involved in security intelligence um, is, is partly to be aware of to what extent uh, are individuals or groups or loose organizations involved in uh, perfectly legitimate uh, political activity. Uh, they may be involved in, in lobbying, they may be involved in, in legitimate uh, civil actions. But one, one challenge this, the intelligence community faces from a security perspective is uh, even if 99% of the people involved in that uh, mm. are law-abiding, uh, do not pose a, a serious threat to Canada, are there individuals within those communities who feel more radical uh, and may tip over into violence? Um, and so for the community in one sense has to at least f be aware of the size, scope, scale and interests of uh, a, a, an issue group, an advocacy group writ large, which it can in fairness do by a lot of open source information, press releases, just listening to the activities of groups. But they also have a mandate to advise and warn government to say, okay, you know, I'll, know, I'll just pick one randomly. There might be individuals involved in um, animal rights who may, have, may feel that legislation has not gone far enough, that the Canadian public is not interested enough in this, and more radical uh, act activities needed to put this into the public's eye to get action, to get a reaction. Some of those may, and I'm, I'm just being hypothetical here, may be thinking about violence or have been involved in violence elsewhere. The Canadian community has to take on some role in thinking about and being aware of that. It therefore has to have some knowledge of the scope and scale of that group. The challenge is sorting out, in one sense, the wheat from the chaff and trying to work out where is the legitimate activity, which is almost certainly in the Canadian case where the vast majority of it occurs, versus those who may tip into occasional or potentially sustained violence. And to be aware of that, you have to be aware of the group. And this, in one sense, means that they have to be able to advise the RCMP or provincial authorities or other authorities to say, okay, you've got a meeting occurring is there a threat of violence to this meeting? They might say no, but in order for them to say no with confidence, they have to have had some level of activity, which means they have to have looked at this group. Anyone else on the panel? Um, I would just add to what Jess has pointed out that, uh, first of all, he's absolutely correct, but it is a really difficult area. And the, the simplest example and perhaps it's in a bit of an oversimplification, is the anti-abortion movement. Perfectly legitimate, of absolutely no interest to CSIS or uh, the FBI in the United States or any other security agency. However, a very small number of individuals in there, numbering a handful, became involved in going around and killing people that operated abortion clinics. Should we not look for those people? Should we simply in the interest of all of the other anti-abortionist uh, individuals who are perfectly legitimate in their concerns, should we ignore the potential that there are a few people who can cause tremendous damage to society? Follow-up question or? That's great. That's it? Okay. I think that's the end of our questions. Let's, oh, we've got another question. Yes, sorry. Just come on up. question would be for Jeff. Um, generally speaking, the security intelligence agencies and cryptologic agencies have two mandates. The first being to protect domestic communications and, and security intelligence, as well as to collect, analyze, and disseminate foreign intelligence communication. However, recently the Stone Revelations have revealed how uh, the NSA has actually broken and weakened the technical infrastructure of private corporations, for example, Google, where they broke the SSL encryption. My question would be, what are our reasonable expectations of online privacy today? Well, I'll tell you what I tell my uh, journalism students. Uh, don't do anything digitally 
<laughs> that you're not prepared to have viewed by somebody else, someplace else, at some other time. Uh, I don't think, you know, uh, there is uh, a safe uh, area uh, for your activities if it's being done digitally. Uh, it's just, uh, you know, somebody is going to find a new algorithm to break the Google uh, firewall, uh, and it's just, uh, in, in many ways, just throwing computing power uh, against uh, the other side and then you know, finding it doubled over there and, and so on. So that's a losing proposition. Uh, I think uh, this raises some very interesting uh, thoughts, though, about uh, you know, old-fashioned kinds of uh, communication, uh, and uh, well, we you know we, we saw this with the Bin Laden takedown. Uh, he uh, was communicating with uh, uh, his followers uh, with a, a USB uh, key uh, that a courier was uh, uh, taking back and forth, and uh, he was able to evade uh, the notice of the United States uh, in. Uh, uh, that little town in Pakistan for uh, quite a period of time uh, because uh, he wasn't uh, making himself vulnerable to that kind of an, uh, an interception. So uh, I'm sorry for having to say this for people who are very concerned about privacy, but uh, uh, we are going to have to rethink uh, what privacy really means and uh, how frightened should we be about it if it is being invaded for good purposes by good people. Kurt, and then Jeff, maybe you could come on. Uh, absolutely correct. We need uh, a whole different approach to look at privacy, and it'll come, probably not for a decade or more, because it is a complex issue that hasn't really reached the end of its current path. Um, I might add to what Jeff was saying about uh, uh, Osama bin Laden, the, his concern with his privacy was actually a factor in him being captured. It was the only house in that place that had absolutely no phone, no TV, no internet, no nothing. And this, that became one of the building blocks in the uh, American assessment that this was probably a bad guy. So it works both ways. <laughs> Just talk about privacy. I think the, the, the concern uh, about the partly coming out of the Snowden revelations, is, is what we might consider to be the chilling effect. Um, you know, are the intelligence agencies, you know, writ large, this all-seeing, all-knowing organization where your information is captured by default uh, and therefore anything you, you know, you have no concerns, you have no privacy in one sense. I think what will change with our understanding of privacy is a recognition of the amount of information we willingly share or we, we we offer our consent to share it, given the fact that we use the likes of Google or other forms of social media. Um, and then it's becoming, it, we'll have to come to some understanding about what the role of the intelligence organizations are as they collect various portions of this information and what they can do with it legitimately, uh, legitimately under a warrant or under the existing legislation. I would be extremely nervous if someone was to come out saying, I, as a citizen, I have, no, I, I, I have no right to privacy anymore because of technological capabilities. I think that's the completely the wrong way to go, and I don't think that's going to wash in any democratic society. But equally, we're going to have to get over, as individuals, uh, the notion that you know, an email I share with Jeff uh, is never going to be seen or read or stored by anybody else, because that's not the case. It, is, it, it can be read by somebody else, if necessary. And it's certainly been stored by somebody else because I'm transmitting it over somebody else's infrastructure. Now, to what extent an intelligence agency has an, a right to see that and access it, and can they read it, or do they just have to happen to know that, oh, yeah, that's, you know, Jez Littlewood is sharing an email with Jeff Salad, is a different, is a slightly different issue. Um, so I think we're going to have to grapple with this, just as we're going to have to grapple with many other issues, such as accountability. Uh, and this, for me, is the, the, the most important implications of the Snowden discussion, is, is it should open up the, the debates, which will have to be thoughtful and measured, which really do provide the foundation for the next five to ten years about, okay, what, how do we share information, who has access to it, uh, and what are the rules of the intelligence organizations? Follow-up question or no? No, thank you. Okay, we have one more question. 
Hi, uh, my name is Jonathan. I'm from uh, Nipsia, and uh, my question is directed to Professor Littlewood. It's regarding uh, Canadians who uh, go abroad to engage in extremism. What's the current approach of Canadian intelligence agencies uh, in terms of information sharing on these people? Do we, uh, let's say hypothetically, a Canadian of Somali origin goes and joins Al-Shabaab. Do we give that information to the United States who then use that to carry out a drone strike which kills and ends up killing this Canadian citizen? Is that something that might be currently done or what's, what's your opinion on that maybe? The, the short answer is I think I don't know and I don't think we know in the public domain. Um, it's, it's clear in one sense, one thing we have to get our heads around is that intelligence, and particularly in this, is, this is a challenge for the Canadian community, that you know, we think about CSIS as being, for want of a better term, domestic intelligence, it's internal, and we think about CSEC as foreign signals intelligence being outside. We know those boundaries, the external, internal boundaries of security, have become very blurred across a number of areas, including in the, the terrorism and violent extremism area. And so our intelligence by necessity uh, because information has to be shared, is in one sense crossing uh, what we might consider to be internal and external boundaries, borders and boundaries. There are rules and procedures in place for doing that. But in the public domain, you know, to pick up the foreign fighter uh, indication, it's not clear to me how it's working in practice. Um, but if we have an individual, and I'll, I'll talk hypothetically here, if we have an individual in Canada who is suspected of being on the road to violent extremism, and then it becomes known that that individual is planning to leave Canada and go to another country, and, and Syria is the hotbed at this point in time for attracting foreign fighters, then the government of Canada has some responsibility there because it's a Canadian citizen who may be con con potentially conducting violence abroad. How they deal with that uh, in terms of potentially alerting other countries uh, that an individual with, with what was suspected to be violent intentions and may be traversing their borders uh, has to be considered. Uh, what that individual may or may not get up to in a country or a theater of conflict also has to be considered. Uh, and then ultimately, if that person returns back to Canada, then again, we have some, some security issues or intelligence concerns there which are legitimate. So, okay, well, does this individual now uh, pose some level of threat to Canada? I don't, I, I'll go a little bit out on a limb, but be clear that I don't know this. I would not anticipate um, that the Canadian intelligence community uh, will be sharing information with the Americans or with anybody else uh, about a Canadian national abroad uh, in thinking about terms of drone strikes. Um, that said, I think that's a very good question to ask that we, can, we should actually be thinking about in, a, in, a, in, a, in one sense a structured exercise to understand, okay, what are the limits of what can be done? How do we deal with some of these issues? Um, and you know, how is intelligence working in practice? We probably won't get to the nitty gritty answer, the granular level detail, but it would assist us to understand the role of intelligence if we did think about some of these hypothetical questions in a measured way. Um, uh, but yeah, the foreign fighter issue is one that is coming down the line, well, it's here now, but it's coming down the line, and we're going to have to give that some consideration. Thoughts from anyone else? It's not really a hypothetical issue. We've had uh, instances of uh, Canadians uh, traveling abroad and getting scooped up uh, because of... Uh, uh, information that was shared with another government. Uh, the Beharar case is the, uh, the, the most infamous uh, case in this regard. Uh, Canadian uh, agencies, in this case the RCMP, uh, provided bad intelligence to the Americans. Uh, and as a result, uh, Beharar uh, was uh, sent in the middle of the night uh, from uh, New York City, a uh, uh, detention cell there, uh, to the Middle East, where he uh, was eventually transferred to Syria, and to, he spent a year being tortured uh, in, in Damascus uh, because of bad intelligence. I think if uh, Canadian agencies are uh, going to uh, share, and I think we have to, it'd be really naive to think that that couldn't occur, we have to also make sure that uh, the people we are sharing it with understand what the limitations are on our intelligence uh, and we need to know what 
uh, is the limit of what uh, our foreign partners are going to do. I'm sure nobody uh, in the RCMP really thought uh, the whole thing out before they shared questions uh, to be uh, raised with uh, Mayor Arar when he was uh, stopped at uh, JFK Airport in New York City. Uh, I'm sure that there were uh, you know, people who might have suspected uh, this kind of thing would go uh, along, but they would never have turned a blind eye to it uh, if they knew for sure. Uh, so we have to be careful. Uh, the quality of, of information, you know, just, uh, you know, I tell young uh, reporters this as well, you know, they, they are very excited because they've gotten a document that's been leaked or they've gotten a document through access to information. Uh, and I say, you know, look, a document is just another source. You don't really know uh, whether the information contained here is true or not. Uh, the document, uh, in fact, uh, may have been written to throw people off the, the trail, uh, or it's incomplete, uh, and you can't interrogate a document uh, to ask those questions to determine the quality of the information. So, uh, you know, on issues involving the privacy of individuals, I think uh, uh, an abundance of tr transparency is probably the way we're going to have to go so that people will have a right to know exactly what is in uh, government files and records about them in the same way they have a right uh, now in Canada to their credit records. Uh, Kurt, did you want to comment and then Jez? Yes. Last comment on this one. This is a real messy area that will probably get worse before it gets better. There are a lot of difficulties in it. You have two conflicts the protection of the individual, the Canadian, and the protection of people at large that this guy may be in aiming at, at killing. How do you reconcile the two? There are no rules in place right now. And will sharing occur? Almost certainly, because they will focus on the protection of, of human life as much as they can. Um, the main thing with, with sharing of information is that uh, caveats are all, usually or should be placed on what can be done with that information. In the case of the ARA inquiry, or ARA situation, there were no caveats and the information was shared by people who had not been properly trained in, and had really no intelligence background. There were um, very excitable RCMP officers that went beyond um, the rules of their own organization in sharing information with the United States and that to horrendous uh, consequences. Yes. Yeah, Jeff raised a very important point. I was a very important point that we have had past instances of this where it has had extremely detrimental uh, impacts on individuals, uh, and he's absolutely right there. I, w I was thinking in terms of the, the drone strikes, if you like, or UAV strikes. Um, but in ta you know, information sharing, intelligence sharing is a fact of life now, particularly for a country like Canada, uh, both as providing it and also being the recipient of it. Um, the key to it is having individuals who are well versed in the existing procedures or whatever new procedures may be offered uh, to, to act as safeguards. And at the crux of that is having organizations and individuals who can handle an, uh, information in a crisis environment. Um, there are some indications that certainly for, uh, going back to the ARA uh, instance, that it happened at a period of time when people were extremely worried. A lot of new people were brought in who were inexperienced, uh, and people were thinking in crisis mode and not thinking through the implications of what they do, what they're doing. Um, but it all harks back to having that sort of structure and bureaucracy and well-trained individuals in place who can deal with a situation on a day-to-day -day basis, but also deal with it on a crisis, uh, crisis level as, as well. So you don't get the kind of huge mistakes with, with massively detrimental impacts on an individual that we saw in the Iraq case. And we've seen in other cases in Canada too. Can we go to our last question now? Yes, uh, <coughs> George uh, Jacoby, retired uh, Foreign Service with some service abroad in intelligence sensitive areas such as the Middle East, Latin America, in company with other Canadian officials, uh, for instance, from the Department of National Defense, National Revenue, um, CSIS, <coughs> and others, also engaged in intelligence such as the diplomatic corps engages in. And I'm just wondering if, considering the current Canadian capacity in this area, whether Dr. Jensen thinks we need a designated foreign offensive intelligence service such as the CIA, Mossad, MI6, or, or do we have sufficient capacity now 
to carry out uh, Canada's uh, best interests and national security interests. Thanks, George. Um, do we have enough capacity to do what should be done? No. Will we ever have it? Probably not. Um, Canada does not have a dedicated foreign intelligence service. Um, in 1951, I think it was, we made the decision that uh, the nation would not go that way. That was at the time when the British were helping the Australians to establish their clandestine foreign intelligence service. What Canada does have is a small group of individuals that do collect intelligence uh, both in, inside Canada, uh, less so today, and certainly outside Canada. They don't use clandestine methods, they simply use unconventional approaches to gathering uh, information in, in, in somewhat similar ways to what uh, diplomats uh, do. Um, uh, there is information in the public domain that there are, as of now, 24 of those officers stationed abroad. They're part of something that's called the Global Security Reporting Program. Uh, they, are, they were created in 2002, 2003, can you remember? Um, it's a small group. They work openly. They're not declared as intelligence officers, nor do they maintain uh, clandestine sources. They do not pay sources for information. They approach individuals and you'll be surprised how easy it is to get information. It's, uh, it's not difficult at all to get most of the information that a nation such as Canada requires. What we require is probably not in the same league as what the United States looks for. Uh, we have different interests what Canada needs in terms of foreign intelligence is more uh, strategic information to understand what is happening in a foreign country. The tactical information that uh, uh, occupies a lot of American interest is really beyond our uh, capability to deal with it. Uh, what we need is enough understanding on what is occurring in a foreign nation to be able to uh, inform the Minister of Foreign Affairs and uh, the Prime Minister as to what can be expected in, in a given situation and what are the factors that uh, influence decisions in that environment, what are the caveats that might uh, determine different decisions and so forth. It's a different league of intelligence from what the United States is after. It's not uh, great nation intelligence, it is an understanding of what is taking place on the ground. Jeff or Jeff, any thoughts? Uh, just a, a kind of a, a footnote uh, about uh, domestic versus foreign intelligence gathering. I, I used to think that uh, uh, Canada did need its own uh, separate foreign intelligence agency. Uh, I've changed my thinking on this uh, because we've seen too many instances where stovepipes, not just in the intelligence area, but uh, uh, in other operations of government, uh, have uh, been detrimental to uh, the outcome of, of events. So uh, I think uh, a, an agency that has a mandate uh, that could very well take uh, you off to uh, a part of the world uh, and, uh, you know, and therefore into the world of foreign intelligence, uh, I think we need that kind of organization, uh, particularly when we're dealing with uh, uh, things like uh, counterterrorism, where uh, a lot of what is going on uh, flows across borders, you know, like money, uh, for one thing. Uh, money doesn't know any boundaries. Uh, we have got large numbers of, uh, of people who have uh, uh, family attachments and other kinds of economic attachments, perhaps, in different parts of the world. Uh, and they live in, uh, in Canada, but uh, uh, they are active uh, in other parts of the world in areas that, uh, you know, perhaps they shouldn't be involved in. So. Uh, just that one thought that uh, we should uh, uh, not build stovepipes, uh, I guess is the way I'd put it. Last word to Jess. Um, I, I'm, I'm not in favor of creating a new organization, the, the Canadian Foreign Intelligence Service or whatever people might call it. Uh, Canada has a foreign intelligence capability. It's, it's predominantly run from CSEC. If you think about foreign uh, intelligence, if we think about security intelligence issues, then the mandate of the Security uh, Intelligence Service, CSIS, uh, is not limited to only being operating in Canada. It can 
uh, and it does operate abroad when there is a security uh, threat uh, to, to can Canadian interests. Um, for Canada, which spends, you know, it spends more than a billion dollars, but headline figures if we put CSEC and CSIS together is about a billion dollars. It's really about having an honest conversation about you know, what is Canada's role in the world uh, and what does it want to do, and then thinking through, okay, well, what then are the intelligence requirements of Canada uh, in the next decade, in the next few decades, uh, and altering, I think, the, or fine-tuning the existing machinery in place to make sure as many bases as, as possible are covered. But let's not forget, Canadian security is provided not only by Canadians, but as a result of being enmeshed in multiple alliances and organizations. And our intelligence agencies work in that way too. On that note, I think we'll wrap it up. I'd like to thank um, all three of our panelists, Jez, Kurt, and Jeff, and our audience as well for your questions. And uh, we'll be back with another session soon. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Thank you.